We have a really exciting lineup for you tonight. Um, Yvonne Blake is an Academy Award winner. She's dressed film legends such as Sophia Loren, Audrey Hepburn, Sean Connery, Robert De Niro, Marlon Brando, and Al Pacino in dozens of films. Some of her most outstanding works can be seen in Superman, Nicholas and Alexandra, Jesus Christ Superstar, Looking for Richard, Flesh and Blood, and The Three Musketeers. She is a Spanish designer of British origin with an extensive career working in Spain as well, where she was awarded the Royal Decree of His Majesty King Juan Carlos of Spain and the Ministry for Works and Immigration, the Gold Medal for her work in Spanish cinema, and the National Film Award by the Ministry of Culture of Spain. So she's an extremely accomplished person. And she will be in discussion with my dear friend, Dr. Sorry, Dr. Deborah Nadelman Landis, who is a professor, Landis, received her MFA in costume design from UCLA, and a PhD in the history of design from the Royal College of Art, London. Her distinguished career includes the horror comedy Burke and Hare, Coming to America, for which she was Academy Award nominated, An American Werewolf in London, Raiders of the Lost Ark, yes, those are her costumes, the classic Animal House, where I went to school, Dartmouth, and the costumes for the groundbreaking music video, Michael Jackson's Thriller. Professor Landis is the author of many books, including Film Craft, Costume Design, Hollywood Sketchbook, A Co Century of Costume Illustration, Dressed, A Century of Hollywood Costume Design, and Screen Craft Costume Design. In 2012, she wrote the catalog for the landmark exhibition, Hollywood Costume, which she curated at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. And if you missed it there, it's going to be in Virginia later this winter. From 2001 to 2007, Professor Landers served as a two-term president of the Costume Designers Guild, Local 892, of which she's been a member for more than 35 years. And she's the governor of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. So please join me in welcoming Yvonne and Deborah. talk about uh, Yvonne's career. Yvonne is going to talk about her career for about 45 minutes. And then after about 45 minutes, we're going to open it up to questions from all of you. Would you like to start? Good evening. It's wonderful to be here. Um, right, I'm going to start. There are many kinds of costume designers. There are those who are researchers and sketchers. And there are those who are great shoppers. There are those who do collages and photographic montages. However, each one of us, um, each one of us, we all bring something of our own in our own particular way, but each one of us brings something different to the table. However, our goal is always the same, and that is to to dress our characters in a way that, um, that, what, that the way they dress shows who they are, where they come from, the climate they live in, their mood, and everything, everything about them. I can't see very well. Their social status, and we have to make them look as instantly credible wrinkles, warts, and all, and never look costumed. The greatest satisfaction that we have is when an actor stands in front of the mirror in costume and says, wow, now I feel the part. I would also like to make it clear that we are neither fashion designers nor stylists, although we need to have a very good background of, of uh, costume history. 
Should there, be, should there be any confusion about this? The other possible misconception is that it's easier to do modern day costumes than period costumes. That's a myth. It, <laughs> right? Yes, <laughs> right. That's a myth. Right. <laughs> it's nearly always period costumes that win Oscars because they're more flamboyant. But, um, but we believe that this is unfair and that ordinary clothes are much more difficult to conceive and get right than period ones. I've designed films for about 50 years, and for as long as I can remember, I've never wanted to do anything else, and I haven't, apart from theater. I feel very, very fortunate. I feel terribly lucky to have lived a life doing, doing the kind of work that I really love. I've worked on every kind of film, large and small, huge budgets, minuscule ones. I've delved into the closets of friends and family, trying to find something that would work for an actor. Film work is teamwork, and it's important. Film work is teamwork, and it's important to work together with the production designer so that you can exchange color palettes. I get samples of wall coverings and furnishings from the art department and in return give them swatches of dress and suit fabrics that I'm using. The same thing with the director of photography. Meetings with him, to meetings with him are very important to discuss the look, the look of the film and the type of light that he will use. Naturally, everything revolves around what, what's in the script. And of course, what kind of film the director wants to make. One's relationship with the director is of prime importance because the film is actually, it's his vision and, and it's, it's always going to be his film and we have to work according, according to that. I've never found drawing terribly easy. For me, it's a labor of love and I do an awful lot of erasing. When I start, I usually put fabrics together before, I, before pencil touches paper. I do little compositions of colors, and, of colors and, and textures, and then I do my drawings. I, want the, I, I always like my drawings to have a lot of details and to look as though, um, to see the fabrics painted and to look like it's going to look on the screen. What's very important to me is that when I show costume director, costume, my costume sketches to the director, what you see is what, you know, what you see is what you get. And also to the costume maker so that there is no confusion. Nowadays, a lot of costume designers don't draw at all. And, and that's fine. They have sketch artists or they just do compositions. They work very well. One doesn't have to draw. Um, I find it's best for me. It's the way I've worked. I think I'm of the old school, and, and I work better that way. The wardrobe department used to be the ugly duckling of the, of the film crew. But now, thanks to people like Deborah, writing books and promoting our profession, we are now coming to the surface and we're getting to be more important because what we do is important. <laughs> it was suggested that I talk tonight about my career highlights, but I haven't finished yet. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about my experiences on movies that I'm proud of, or rather that I'm not too ashamed of. If you don't mind, I'm going to take my glasses off because, but I've got a, I've got a black eye because I had a fall yesterday. But I can't see with <laughs> in dark glasses. <laughs> so yeah, this is much better. I can see what I'm reading now. Um, okay, the first film that I'm going to talk about tonight is Fahrenheit 451, directed by Francois Truffaut. It's a science fiction, so based on a science fiction film by 
Ray Bradbury. It was my fourth film. I was brought into the project by, by designer Tony Walton. Tony and I had pre previously worked on theater together. Designing Fahrenheit was not a major problem because Francois Truffaut knew exactly what he wanted. He made it clear to me that he didn't want sci-fi costumes. However, he did like what I designed for the, uh, for the fireman. The fireman in the movie Burn Books. And he liked what I had, he liked what I had done because um, it had a sort of Nazi in influence. Oops. Julie Christie played two parts in the movie. She played Linda, the wife of a fireman, long-haired, sleek, and glamorous, but empty, mindless, and brainwashed by society. Julie Christie plays Clarice again, with short hair, the young girl who the fireman eventually falls in love with because she questions, she questions society and, and she runs away with to, to work with the book people who all, all learn books by heart. That's Clarice, oops, it's jumping ahead. Don't worry. Clarice and the fireman and her fireman. Um, in this Clarice, I dressed Julie Christie actually the way I dressed myself in that period in the 1960s. Um, she, wore, she wore a green suede jacket and a turquoise and blue, and blue dress. Now I'm going to interrupt you. I hope okay. you I hope can I, I don't stop this. This is not stopping <coughs> actually. Um, Paul? Paul? Can you help out? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't, it moves on. Well, uh, while Paul is figuring this out, I, I really wanted to stop you because I love this green jacket, <laughs> and I would like one just like it. <laughs> so my question to you is, um, in that sketch, is, is this a design and manufacture, this jacket? Yes. I designed it and made it. The dress I bought. Uh, so you bought the dress, and it was a black and white movie. No, it wasn't. It, it was, was a color, color movie. It was a color like movie. Said, yeah, black and white. No, but I've got, I've got clips for the movie, of the movie to show. Oh, marvelous. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Yvonne. All right. What? If, if you don't hit the button. Oh, it's it just, okay. Okay. My, okay. my finger was getting twitchy. That's, <laughs> okay. That's why Paul, that's why Paul's there. <laughs> now, one thing, I will move on one. Um... When I had my meetings with Truffaut, I, I, used, I used to blush a lot, and I was very shy, and I blushed a lot. So right at the end of the movie, he said that he wanted me to play a little part in the movie. He wanted me to be a book person, and, and he said that he wanted me to be the, the Jewish question by Jean-Paul Sartre. Because <laughs> I'm Jewish. <laughs> and... Um, and, and on this day, he wanted me to blush as well, but I couldn't blush. I had to go and rub my cheeks like, like that. <laughs> I had to rub my cheeks, and I just I couldn't blush to call. And it was terribly cold where we were shooting, so he lent me his scarf, which is what I'm wearing there. Yes, it was all very, it was very sweet. Um, when I, when I started the film, I knew nothing about Truffaut. I didn't know anything about the Nouvelle Vague or anything like that. But um, he was wonderful to work with, absolutely, absolutely brilliant. I'm now going to show you the clip. That's brief. Is it true that a long time ago, farmen used to put out fires and not burn books? Oh, really, Yonk, it's right. You are like the head. Put fires out, who told you that? Oh, I don't know, someone, but is it true, did they? Oh, what a strange idea. There's nothing there. The books have nothing to say. All about people that never existed. The people that read them, it makes them unhappy with their own lives, makes them want to live in other ways. They can never really be.
Why should I? First, I'm not interested. Second, I've better things to do. And third, it is forbidden. You're nothing but zombies, all of you. Just like those husbands of yours you don't even know anymore. You're not living, you're just killing time. Nicholas and Alexandra. I was recommended for, uh, to possibly do Nicholas and Alexandra by the director, Fred Zinnerman, who I was supposed to work with on a film, but the film fell through. In my meeting with Sam, he said, I don't know you from Adam, but I have a feeling that you could do this movie. It was my 13th movie, and I was only 30 years old. Any previous experience that I had had bore no relation whatsoever on the enormity of this one. The project was huge. Here are some sketches that I did for Alexandra for the Empress. This was the first one I did, which was when she was expecting um, her baby, the, the Prince Alexei, who was born with hemophilia. It's a silk nightgown with, um, with inserted lace and lots of fine stitching. This is the Empress going to the ball. I actually got married during, this, during the preparation of this film, but no time for a honeymoon. I needed to go to Paris to buy the Zebeline furs to, to trim this cape. And Sam Spiegel invited my husband to join me in Paris for a few days um, fur, fur buying, which was very nice. <laughs> Alexandra on holiday at Livadia in a white foil summer dress, again with lace insertion and the straw hat. Here again um, in an astrakhan, a grey astrakhan winter coat trimmed with chinchilla fur and a chinchilla hat at the station waiting to see off the troops. Another linen outfit and hat. How many, how many costumes were there in all <coughs> for, uh, for, say, for, for the Tsarina in Nicholas and Alexander? Oh, there must have been about 50. <laughs> there, were, 50. there were a lot. I don't remember. I, I don't remember counting, but there were an awful lot, no. an awful lot. It was, it, was a huge, it was a huge movie. I mean, it's absolutely enormous. Um, however, those were kind of the good old days. This is the, the royal family going out onto the balcony um, to greet the troops. And, and this is the saddest film. This is the saddest photograph of the, this is the, saddest photograph of the film. Um, to me, um, you know, we, we all cried a bit on this film. The crew cried because it was just such a sad, it, so many sad things happened. This was when they thought they were going to move, be moved to another, to another place, and the Bolsheviks came in and shot the whole family. For 300 years, the Romanovs ruled Russia. They might have ruled for 300 more. Within the eye of the storm that ravaged an entire continent, beneath the pomp and ceremony of a dying dynasty, is the tender and tragic love story that inspired Robert K. Massey's international bestseller, Nicholas and Alexandra. Sometimes I wonder how you live with me. I wonder too. Only I know I could never live without you. Endured for centuries, was destroyed, and a proud family humbled. A chain reaction from what began... How many dead? Who ordered the shooting? Hundreds of bodies. Nobody ordered it. Someone's responsible. Nicholas, the murderer. You ask me who's responsible. You ask! Vicky, I adore you. God's hands. Submit, submit. 
Won't you ever fight? I can't fight you. My baby's dying. There are no medicines. Christ Jesus! Murder, arson, terror. I'll agree to anything that gives us power. Power? Your Majesty, at ten minutes past seven this evening, Germany declared war on Russia. He is a man of God. Do you believe that? He works miracles. He keeps my son alive. Do you believe that, Nicky? Why did you abdicate for me? Why? You didn't even ask. I didn't want you to pay for my mistakes. Am I not paying for them now? Not all of us. I still want you so much. Nothing can change that, Sonny. I do love you. The good thing about this, about the re finding the research for this movie, was that there was masses of it, of it about because it was recent history. Also, those were the good old days, a huge budget and a year's prep. Mm. A large crew, unheard of these days. I was overwhelmed. But when you're 30 years old, everything seems groovy <laughs> in the studio. <laughs> but, but when I came home at night, I had to pour myself a large glass of wine <laughs> to calm my nerves. But you get on with the job and hope for the best. We prepped in London, but shot mostly in Madrid. To be honest, I find the costumes and the sets now look very out of date. The colors are very 70s, and, um, and of course our research was in black and white. If I were to do a remake of this film, God help me, it would look quite different. Yvonne, it actually looked very much of the time it, it was made. I know, but that's not good. <laughs> it should have looked like the time that it happened. <laughs> I know. And I know that it looks like that, but, and it bothers me now. But you know, Yvonne, um, later on, we can have the conversation about whether a film should and can look perfectly, period. Well, I think that, which I'll go to at the end, the last film I was going to talk to you about was Boyer's Ghost. Okay. And I think I pulled it off on that one. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. Carry on. Um, Sam Spiegel might have been one of the great Hollywood producers, but as a person, he was an absolute monster. Poor Franklin Schaffner, the director, was charming, but rarely consulted, and everything went through Sam. The film was his baby, but he was rude and nasty, not only to me, but to everyone, even to people like Lawrence, Sir Lawrence or Olivier, who was actually quite sick at the time, quite unwell. The film was a nightmare. I actually cried all the time. <laughs> When I, as I just got married, my husband used to come and meet me at the studio gates and I would fall into his arms oh. with weeping, saying, oh, I can't go to another day. <laughs> when it was all over, I only wanted to be a housewife and, a few, and an eventual mom. But out of the blue, a, a nomination to the drama right, um, winning to me was unthinkable. But my husband was working on a film in Turkey, so my father organized everything, and off we went. I can't go into details. There's no time. <laughs> Jesus Christ Superstar. Sometime later, I got a call from Norman Jewison's office to meet with him regarding doing costumes for the movie of Jesus Christ Superstar. I was thrilled at the prospect and, and thought it was recent and thought, it's, it's not stopping. <laughs> and, thought, and, <laughs> and thought that I had it in the bag, but I was wrong. During our interview, Norman suggested that I send in some sketches with ideas computing with, competing with other designers. I was shocked. But I've just won an Oscar. Doesn't that mean anything to you? <laughs> he said, not to me. He said, not to me. They're two completely different films. This is a rock opera. So I sent him a few ideas, and I got the job. It happened to be one of my most challenging projects. It gave me sleepless nights. 
I suffered designer's block. Suddenly, I saw the light. I got it. The cast would look as though they had improvised their own costumes, total simplicity, and mainly in warm, earthy colors. Here are the Jewish priests in black cheesecloth, um, black cheesecloth robes um, with gold breastplates depicting the 12 tribes of Israel, black leather hats that were very tall, and black jeans. Very simple. Mary Magdalene in a cheesecloth dress. We shot the whole film in Israel in intense heat. All the costumes were made out of dyed organic cottons of various textures. They were trimmed with wool hand embroidery. I loved working in the Negev desert, watching the dancers rehearse to such fabulous music. It was the closest I'd ever been to living in a hippie commune. There was not a decent hotel in sight. We lived in, we actually lived in schools that were on holiday. <laughs> a, thick, a photo of a much slimmer me fixing I don't know what on a dancer that I can't remember who. <laughs> It's Carl Anderson in Judas, in red cheesecloth shirt with hand embroidery. Pontius Pilate in simple black jeans, a t-shirt and a very plush red pur uh, purple, purple cloak. There's Judas coming down from heaven and the three Supremes who are angels in, for the big rock number. There's, there's, that's the big rock number. The, the other angels are all wearing flesh bikinis with long fringed iridescent plastic um, fringes that we cut by hand. <clears throat> I adored working with Norman Jewison on a personal level, but at times found him very frustrating because he found it so difficult to, to make up his mind as to what he wanted. I'm deeply fond of this movie because I got to know the composers, Tim Rice and Andrew Lloyd Webber, who um, just got such a kick out of watching these young kids dance in this, these incredible settings and, and to their wonderful music. It was magical. Here's a short clip. The sound is on. Christ, prove to me that you're divine and change my water into... Musketeers. I've worked with more with director Richard Lester than with any other. We've done five films together. This was our first. We both agreed that the fun part of a movie is in the preparation and the research. I was inspired by the work of Rubens Van Dyck and Jacques Callot. Um, here's Jean-Pierre Cassel and Geraldine Chaplin. 
I have an anecdote about Geraldine Chaplin. One day I was doing her fittings in London and she very timidly said, Yvonne, would you mind if my mum and dad came in to watch the fitting? They're, they're outside. Could you believe I had Charles Chaplin and Una O'Neill sitting in my fittings? <laughs> this is Milady at the ball um, as well. Everybody wore animal headdresses. She's wearing, she's wearing a, a butterfly headdress and, and the whole ball was in shades of white and silver. There's Milady again in a very elaborate um, embroidered corset and a, and a bum roll that padded out the, the skirt. And she had a dagger in the middle, a painted dagger in the middle of her corset that she could pull out at any time to do some terrible misdeed. Michael York as D'Artagnan and um, Oliver Reed as Athos. Michael York's costume was in, was in black um, embroidered wool and, the, and Oliver Reed's costume was in black leather with cording. Uh, one thing about it, that everything had to be very aged and distressed. These costumes had to look terrible and all the lace had to be ripped and, and everything had to be dirtied and made and scratched and made filthy. But I had a very, very elegant French wardrobe master who, when I said, listen, Jean, you have to really work on these costumes. They've got to look like shit, you know. <laughs> and, um, and he said, I refuse. They are so beautiful. So we had to let him go. <laughs> <laughs> Charlton Heston as um, Richelieu. When I went to Charlton Heston's house to t in California to take him his designs, I was very pleasantly surprised to see that he uh, had done all his own research for the film, um, very much from the same sources that I used, so I felt that we were on a par. Here's a clip. The world's most popular novel is now an eye-popping, swashbuckling, side-splitting screen spectacular. Full of action, romance, danger, chivalry, intrigue, adventure, and fun. With a glittering cast of international stars, Oliver Reed, Raquel Welch, Richard Chamberlain, Michael York, Frank Finley, Christopher Lee, Geraldine Chaplin, Jean-Pierre Cassel, Simon Wars, Faye Dunaway, Charlton Heston. It's all for fun and fun for all. The three must... <laughs> Robin and Marion. Again, working with Richard Lester. A wonderful script by James Goldman, starring Sean Connery and Audrey Hepburn. It was all shot in Spain. Here's Richard Harris as, the, as Richard the Lionheart in a court costume. He was actually sick and dying and he had a scarf and, um, and this. Um, I also dressed him in another costume, which I don't have the sketch of, um, in full armor that was metal armor, chain mail, with a fur-lined tabard on top, which weighed a ton. And he had to get on a horse. He had to get on a horse to wear it. And uh, he got on the horse, and he never once complained. I mean, what an actor. Mm. He must have been really uncomfortable, but, but he, he never said a word. You'll see it, actually, on the, in the clip later. Robert Shaw as the Sheriff of Nottingham. He was the baddie of the part. He was dressed, of course, in black, in black tweed, which trimmed with orange studded leather and an orange wooden wool hood, medieval boots. Here's Richard Lester and, and myself on the set with um, Sean Connery in the background wearing his armor. The sketch of the armor apparently is hanging in Mrs. James Goldman's bathroom. <laughs> Good enough. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Audrey Hepburn as Maid Marian. 
in her nun's habit and as Maid Marian. This is me adjusting Audrey's wimple. <laughs> I was very nervous about going to see Audrey at her home in Switzerland. To me, she was a myth. Her film of Funny Face, where she was dressed by Givenchy, inspired me at 14 to be a costume designer. She greeted me wearing no makeup, in jeans, and hair in a ponytail, and she was so natural and welcoming. She liked my designs, even though they were pretty shapeless and crude. She prepared us lunch, and we talked, and we talked about our husbands and babies, and of course, her costumes. Richard Lester, and I will never forget the costume fitting. There she was, standing in front of a three-way mirror, a three, in front of a three-way mirror at Berman's, trying to define her body through this shapeless, shapeless robe made out of scourer or dishcloth material. At, at that moment, she realized just what kind of a movie she was making. The film was not a raging success but at, the t at the time, but it's such a beautiful story and has stood the test of time. It's one of my, it's one of my great favorites. Go fight the sheriffs and the kings. I love you and you make me proud. I thought the man was dead. He's back in Sherwood. Probably he's back in Sherwood, I said. To Marion, the woman he loved, he was her man. You're so beautiful. Come and sit by me. John Connery is Robin Hood. Robert Shaw is the Sheriff of Nottingham. Nicole Williamson is Little John. Richard Harris is Richard the Lionheart. And in her long-awaited return to the screen, Audrey Hepburn is married. No more scars, Robin. It's too much to lose it twice. I've never kissed a member of the clergy. <laughs> Would it be a sin? Once again, um, the Salkins, who produced the musketeer, the musketeer films, had, brought the, had bought the rights from Warner Brothers and called me to start working on, on trip prototypes for the movie. I started prepping long before there was a director or an actor. I worked solely with a production designer, director of photography, and the special effects director. These were then innovators of special effects on a grand scale. Now it seems very familiar, but in those days, pre-digital, we were like Christopher Columbus discovering the new world, a voyage into unknown territory. For months, in front of, a green or blue, uh, in front of blue or green screens, turquoise lycra, or every turquoise lycra in, <laughs> in existence was being tested. Uh, for the flying scenes, because if the, if the lycra was either too green or too blue, Superman would disappear and all we would see are his shorts, <laughs> his boots and his cape. And we actually found the right material in Austria, in a, fab in a factory in Austria. Marlon Brando was cast as Superman's dad. I saw him in a costume that reflected strong light and energy. I looked everywhere for the right material. In desperation, I consulted. In desperation, I consulted the DOP, the Director of Photography, who, um, who suggested a material called 3M material. 
It was what cinema screens were made of. We soon found out that the material would turn black if touched by bare, sweaty hands. So all the assistants on the set had to handle the costumes with white cotton gloves. There's one of them doing just that. The material was scrunched over white gabardine, a white gabardine um, um, suit, and we, all, we had to keep sticking on, sticking on bits of the, of the 3M material so to cover up all the black bits. That's me giving a talk, um, doing a making of, talking about the costumes at Warner Brothers. During Marlon Brando's fittings um, in a house near Pinewood, I asked him to look in the mirror and, and tell me if he, if he liked his costume. And he didn't look in the mirror. He just said, if you like it, I'll love it. He was not at all vain. Too bad he died. I know. <laughs> Tragic. Tragic. Let's go to the Superman costume. The only, ins the only inspiration or research necessary for this costume was the comic itself. The costume obviously could never be changed. It was a question of reproducing what looked like a pretty silly, co a pretty silly costume into one that could be worn by an actor that would look attractive and believable to Superman fans. It was important that the tights and shorts did not look like ballet dancers, so the problem of lumps and bumps was solved by wearing a plastic protection shield normally used by boxers. I tried to make the costume appear as seamless as possible, trying to hide all the fastenings and stitchings where possible. The boots were zipped up the back and covered by a strip of leather with early Velcro to conceal it. Here's Christos, Christopher Reeve at his, at his film test. As you can see, he doesn't have muscles there. They came later because he really worked out and ate a high protein diet. There he's talking to the producers. For Superman, we tested everybody. Um, we even, tested, we even tested the Salkins Beverly Hill dentist who was flown in. <laughs> they were so desperate. But when Chris came, it was just, he did a, did a fantastic test. But when he was shooting, because of nerves, he used to get black patches. He sweated so profusely, mm -hmm. black patches under his arms. So the crew had to run around with hair dryers all the time, drying, <laughs> drying his underarms. Um, Clark, uh, Clark Kent, I bought all his suits in New York at Barney's and at Brook, Brooks Brothers. Margot Kidder was not easy to dress. She was a bit of a nightmare, actually. Um, she was a cowgirl from Montana who only ever dressed in jeans, shirts, and boots. She had bow legs and no grace or elegance, but she was cute and funny. I tried to transform her. I tried to transform her into a into a chic feminine career girl of the time, wearing silk blouses and skirts and high heels. I'm afraid it was a losing battle. You can't you can't win them all. <laughs> Valerie Perrine, in a in a in a beaded corset and um, pirate pants. Uh, she's also wearing a beaded a beaded and gauze jacket in brown. It, it looked, she looked fantastic and she was so lovely to work with. Gene Hackman, he'd always played such serious parts so he really enjoyed having all these quirky costume changes on this movie. These are the uh, Krypton women, ideas for the Krypton women. And, um, and those were the designs I did for logos for the Krypton mm -hmm. men. A little anecdote, some of these sketches that I've just showed you, I, they don't belong to me, I don't have them, but they're in my computer because an assistant of mine saw that the producer, Elias Solkin, was actually selling my designs on eBay. <laughs> Thousands of dollars. I'm 
no, wait, 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 wait. I'm jumping ahead, I'm jumping ahead, and I'm not ready yet. No, I'm not ready yet. I wanted to talk about Richard Donner, the director. When Richard Donner came aboard, I had already been quite advanced with the costumes, working under John Barry, the production designer. I found Richard very tricky to work with. I showed him all my sketches to hear what he had to say and was perfectly open to make any changes. He looked at them and he said, shit kid, I wish I could tell you. End of conversation. <laughs> I guess he wasn't used to use it, working with costume designers. I guess. Him. No. no. For me, Superman was just another movie. I had no idea then that one day it would become such a classic. This is Goya's Ghost. The day before I was off to Sicily to finish shooting on a big Spanish film, I got a call from a producer in Madrid to say that Milos Forman and his producer Saul Zainz were in town for a film called Goya's Ghost. Milos wanted to meet me at the Ritz at 11.30 the next morning, and he had already seen my CV and, asked for, and I asked for a script. The next morning, I was at the Ritz an hour early to read the script in the lobby. Milos and the producers arrived and apologized, and I apologized for not having had time to finish it. He asked me, do you like what you've read so far? I said, I love it. He replied, I see that you've worked with some very good directors. Would you like to do this movie? Obviously, I was thrilled, but also a little scared. I admired Milos Forman's work so much. The movie starts in 1792, at a time when Goya was popular at court. He painted King Carlos IV and Queen Maria Luisa, also important members of the clergy and, and the Spanish aristocracy. When it came to costuming these characters for the movie, all their portraits, all the Goya portraits were hanging in the, in the Prado, in the Prado Museum. I really didn't find it necessary to do that many designs. I consider Goya to be a much, much better at this than humble me. So I just drew dra diagrams of the cut and chose what I felt were the same exact materials and details as painted by him. All I had to create were the costumes for the fictitious characters for Natalie Portman, Javier Bardem, and other roles, especially some of the more elegant costumes that needed to be made new and embroidered, etc. This is Natalie Portman at, as Inez in interior, a tavern, apricot velvet jacket uh, with embroidered lapels. It was made at Cosbrox in London matching vest, boil skirt trimmed with fringe, and a goyesca um, snood uh, on, on her head, typical at that time in Spain. There's Natalie on the set. It's a continuity still. There's Javier Bardem, dressed to be, to be painted by Goya as a powerful inquisitor of the Holy in Inquisition, very sinister. Natalie Portman, on her way to be to the Inquisition, in a purple, in a purple um, gray velvet jacket that was long at the back, um, and it had a vest with lapels that were all embroidered in silk. That's a portrait by Goya, the Queen Maria Luisa. Actually, um, Goya paints her in the film sitting on a horse, and that's a diagram of the jacket that I had made for her. There's Goya at an easel wearing a brown jacket and, um, and a silk waistcoat. There's a, a, the diagram that I, that I did of, his, of the cut of his jacket. Famous portrait of Goya at the easel um, wearing the hat that had candles in it so that he could paint at night. Mm -hmm. I made the jacket in green suede with, with red cloth um, red cloth facings and gold, gold braid and, and baubles. The, the trousers were in matching colored cloth. There's the sketch.
It was work indeed. Oh, yeah. An artist. So I have a few very powerful friends. A woman adored for her beauty. Why doesn't that painting have a face? Because he's a ghost. No, he is not. How do you know? Do you painters not become very intimate with your models? Who was that girl there? Her name is Alicia. She has taken leave of her senses in jail. Where is Ines? She's in very good hands. Javier Bardem, Natalie Portman. Why is she so important to you? You are completely obsessed with her. That face is engraved on my mind. I'm not going to abandon her again. And lastly, a happy note, one to make you laugh. It's me getting my Oscar. It's hilarious. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my number is 12, and uh, for those of you who don't have a program, my name is Joe Namath. Uh, I'm going to give the award for costume design. Uh, you believe that? <laughs> well, I didn't, but it's true. So here is one of the most popular fashion models in the world, and an actress who made a stunning debut in the last picture show, Sybil Shepherd. Third career. Football player, movie actor, and now fashion commentator. Oh, no, that's your job, Joe. You help me, okay? Oh, I'll help. You know I'll help you. <laughs> this year, folks, for a hint of what you'll be wearing next year, the best achievements in costume design are Mary Queen of Scots, designed by Margaret First. Bed knobs and broomsticks designed by Bill Thomas. Cap and Venice designed by Pietro Tossi. Nicholas and Alexandra, designed by Yvonne Blake and Antonio Castillo. Antonio Castillo from Nicholas and Alexander. Except in the Oscar for Antonio Castillo and herself, Yvonne Blake. <laughs> hardly lifted it. So heavy. Thank you so very, very much. It's a great honor on behalf of Antonio Castillo and myself and our huge wardrobe department that we had on the film. And I suppose all one can say is that if it wasn't for the Russian Revolution, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> Rock 
Oh, thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. You were hilarious. And what, what, what were those pearls? Well, I don't know. I just think they gave a touch of uh, out in Alexandra. I, just, <laughs> I don't know where they are now. Well, thank you. That was a wonderful overview. Are you ready to take some questions from Absolutely. the audience? Absolutely. All right. If we can have the house lights up a little bit so that we can see our friends. We can, um, we have that light shining right I in our am face. slightly deaf, so you have to talk very clearly. Okay, can I not... see anybody's hands up? Do we have any, um, do we have any mics any... for anyone? Yeah, so we have a question right here. Right here. Who had their hand up? Right there. Yes. Hi. I'm Hi. pretty loud all by myself, but anyway. I um, work with vintage clothing. I've done a lot with film and television in the last few years. But I always find it interesting that some costume designers are very, uh, for, uh, authenticity is really important to them. And then others are very like, whatever works. And I was wondering how you I two felt about that. I didn't get all of that. I'm okay, afraid. so the question was, and I have my own answer, um, <laughs> so I'm just saying. Uh, the question was that this uh, young woman uh, worked uh, a lot in film and television, and she noticed that some designers uh, really were committed to authenticity, whatever that means, and others say, whatever works. Is that a fair representation? What is your response? It all depends on what you're working on, because um, there are certain projects that have to look authentic, and there are others that can be very stylized. Um, I think, for example, Nick, um, Nicholas and Alexandra and Goya's Ghosts had to look authentic, but I've done other movies that have been period films, but I've used a lot of imagination, and they've been completely stylized, and I don't think it really matters. What matters is the is whether it goes into the context of the film. Does that answer your question? Well, <laughs> I have a I I really um, have a much more complicated response, <laughs> and my response is about the audience. So, the most important thing we do is to tell a story. That's the most important thing. Absolutely. The story is the king. And I would ask you, if we had an audience and we were telling a story about the early 1930s, do you think that audience could listen to an actress who had shaved her eyebrows and her eyebrows were drawn from the center of her head to the side of her head? If, if, any detail, if any period detail gets in the way of an audience listening to our actors, listening to the story, if any, any part of that authenticity or reaching for authenticity sabotages the audience's attention, that's a huge error. And so we just need to stay out of the way of the storytelling. So when we make a bargain, we make a bargain with our audience, and we make a bargain with the actors, and we make a bargain with the director. Our people in our story always have to be able to be relatable to our audience, so nothing gets in the way of the storytelling. That's right, my absolutely. Yes. And, uh, Hi. Another question? Uh, yes. Uh, your sketches are really beautiful. Where, how did you learn to sketch like that? Or did you go to school? Where did you learn to study? And how did that develop? And at what age? Uh, it's very nice of you to say that. I always have a bit of a complex that I don't draw very well. Um, I went to art school for a while, but I actually left after about a year because I wanted to work, and I have worked more than, than studied. Um, my, my experience was purely practical. 
I've always drawn, ever since I was a little girl, I was always drawing costumes and brides and high heel shoes and things. But actually my drawing is more or less self-taught because when I was at art school, um, I actually never felt that I was learning very much, which is why I left. Uh, it's later on in life, but that was after the sketches that you've seen today that I have, that I have learnt to draw and paint. When I was sort of in my mid-40s, I actually worked with a painter who taught me from A to Z how to start to draw. Um, you, never, you never stop learning. And I find drawing much easier now because I've been taught by somebody who knew how to teach me. Next question. Uh, yes. Uh, Yvonne, you have such an amazing career and you have worked with so many amazing movie directors and uh, movie stars. Among them, who are your favorites? Who are my favorites? Yes. Oof. Um, well, I've had some fascinating experiences. I did a movie, for example, that a little bit of a movie that Al Pacino directed. And I loved working with him. I thought he was fantastic the way he explained things and the way he, he told me what he wanted. I mean, I love working with Marlon Brando because he, was, he made me laugh all the time and he was just so, he, he wasn't vain, he was a very generous man. He was always very concerned about the people that he was working with. Um, he hated the producers, but he was very good with the crew and very generous with the actors. Audrey Hepburn was another woman where, that I felt that we really became very close friends on a movie um, because we both had babies recently and, and we used to share, <laughs> share, we would share experiences and, um, and she gave me very intimate details about her, her marriages and things which um, she really sort of poured her heart out to me and I felt very, very special that she should do such a thing with, with, with me. Um, I don't know, I've worked with so many wonderful people that I remember the, b the better ones and forget about the ones that I'd rather forget about. <laughs> Too scary. Next question. Yes? Uh, how, how, was, how was Faye Dunaway to work with? How was? Faye Dunaway. Faye Dunaway. Faye Dunaway is fantastic to dress, but a nightmare at fittings. She, her fittings would take me about five hours. However, the end result was always worth it. I mean, I like I like Faye. Was, was was that a trick question? Do you do you know Faye? <laughs> yes. <exactly. laughs> uh, did you know what the answer would be? I just wonder. I, I sort of collect stories about her because it's like yeah, the yeah, famous could, Irene Chirac. Oh, there are lots of Faye stories. There are lots of Faye stories. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. What well, would take so long about with the fittings? He's just going to torture us. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, she was just uh, very, she's very perfectionistic. Very much so. Yeah. Yes. I mean, she's fiddling a little bit more in here, a little bit. You know, but, yeah. but, but I don't mind that. I mean, I have a lot of patience, I have to say. Mm. Um, I'm all right as long as they bring me a sandwich during the fitting or something. <laughs> <laughs> but she is very picky and, and a great perfectionist and very nervous about what she does. Yes. She cares a lot, which is good. Next question. What would be your advice for an aspiring designer, someone who's just starting to get their foot in the door but eventually wants to be as great as you two are? Um, a piece of advice. Um, just go and do it. I think people who want to do films as a designer should work with, with people, with young directors who make short films because very often they make short films that are very successful, but then they go and make a full-length movie and they take their crew with them. I think it's very important just to, to, to know how to look is very important. It's all very well looking at research. It's knowing how to use what you see. It's, it's looking. You have to look and take it in and, and investigate and see how things are made and see um, go to museums, look at fabrics, look at books, go to museums. I mean, there's just so much to learn, and you never, ever stop. It's very, 
that's the beauty of this work, really. You never stop. And, and a young person um, should just try to learn as much as they can and also have the confidence to show what they're doing. It's very difficult now, but I think that the more you learn, the more you show, you have to have a, a little bit of, you have to have self-confidence and um, just get on with it. I, I would say that the studios are making um, fewer and fewer films. Mm. Studios are making fewer and fewer features. But more and more movies are being made. And I think it's a wonderful time mm. to be a young designer. Our entire business, many businesses, run on networking. And That's true. It's right. Mm. And I, I have to say that as difficult as it is, uh, remember, there's only one costume designer on every film. Only one costume designer on every film. When you start, and if you start, and you can find young filmmakers, find those young filmmakers, and with any luck, you may not get a job from that filmmaker, but maybe you'll get a job from the first AD. Absolutely. Or who from might become an a, a director. Who, yeah. who you may marry. Yes, if that's right. <laughs> right? Absolutely. And so, you know, it's like a dating service and a career path, and, you know, and then you'd be set for life, and then you'd be here, right? So yes. I think it's all right. You're speaking for yourself. I'm speaking for myself. Okay, next question. Next question. Yes. Can, can you talk about um, your expertise in selecting fabrics? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm over here. I'm over here. And, you, all right. You, oh, oh, yes. You talked a little bit about your expertise in, in drawing and design. Can you talk about how you developed your expertise in selecting fabrics and pattern making and the actual making of the costumes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and also, of, can, yeah. I'm sorry, a second question. If you can just talk a little bit about collaborating with not only the directors, but you talked about with photographers and special effects individuals oh, wow. on the really, film. That really it's is a question. double header. That really is a double header. I didn't hear the end. Okay, the first question is, uh, we talked about the, your expertise in learning how to draw. Mm. This is about your expertise in um, costume manufacture, right. fabric, yes. uh, draping and all that stuff. And then the second question, not really fair to have two questions. The second question is about the collaboration with the other key creative collaborators like the cinematographer and the production designer. So take the first one first. Manufacture. The manufacture. Um, what I always do, which I actually meant to put in my, what I was going to say in the first place, is that I always look for the fabrics first before I do a design. Um, I get very inspired by the textures of the materials and putting them together and the colors. Um, but then, I do it, then I do a design. Then I have a twirl make. I always work on twirls, which is the pattern cut in muslin, put it on a stand so you can see the shape and the volume of it. And then I like to do a twirl fitting on an actor. Um, when the twirls look good to me, you know, you might have to add a bit here or give it a bit more volume in the skirt or in the sleeve or, or whatever. Then we cut the, ex tackle, the expensive materials. Uh, then we do proper, we do proper fittings. Uh, I have to get budgets on the costumes. Yvonne, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you. I think the question was, you were describing your process. The question is, how did you learn how to do all that? Ah, well, I learned because I worked, I worked for four years at Berman's. And um, their workrooms were really haute couture workrooms, and the quality of their work was superb. I worked as assistant to people like when Cecil Beaton came to Berman's to do My Fair Lady with Julie Andrews for the stage. I was holding the pins, I went out to buy feathers, I went to do beading, I went to have things pleated. Uh, I was always watching. I was like a sponge taking it all in. And Mr. Snyder, who did the cutting, was brilliant. And I, you know, I used to see that they, everything was as well made from the inside as it is from the outside. And it was the most wonderful experience. I couldn't have been taught it. I had to, I had to be there to see it and watch it. Um, I'm going to interrupt again just to, I'll be, to facilitate a little bit. Uh, so Berman's and then Berman's, oh, Berman's. Berman's, Berman's and then Berman's and Nathan's was um, a wonderful costume house, a very big costume house 
in Camden and North London. And as you can see, um, these clothes, the clothes that we're talking about, you can imagine that um, they're couture clothes. Right. They, these are things that are, it's a one of that, um, that uh, Mr. Beaton, uh, Cecil Beaton, um, uh, created and that Bond has created. And you're making that costume and working with a cutter fitter from a toile or a muslin draped from a sketch and you're, you're making that one costume for one purpose, for one moment, in one film. It's, it's not mass manufacture. This is uh, the making of, of one magnificent artifact. And so um, Yvonne was there um, at Beaton's elbow, let's just say, Yes. Uh, watching that process very carefully. Is that a fair representation? Yes, absolutely. And I also worked <coughs> in all the different departments of Bur at Berman's at that time. They had a historical costume department with very wonderful people, That's very right. experienced people working there. Mm. Um, I worked in the review department. I actually designed costumes for, for, um, for shows and cabarets and... Um, uh, drag shows, I did, I did everything. I did ice shows from there. Mm. I also got to design a lot of costumes there before I actually went and worked freelance. Mm. So, so it, it was, was a kind of an apprenticeship. It was a wonderful apprenticeship. I mean, it was, uh, you couldn't pay for it. Can we have two more questions and then we'll wrap this up? Yes. Hi, I just want to say you're both so inspiring and I was wondering what your favorite costume that you ever made was. What's your co favorite costume that you ever made? Oh my God. <laughs> I know, you know what happens is if we say, then the rest of them are orphans. <laughs> then that, that leaves a lot that we don't like and they, they might have very I hurt feelings. I don't right? know, I mean, I usually like the, co the costume, I mean, a, a costume, I really, I couldn't tell you. I honestly don't have an answer to that question. Sorry, that's really <laughs> boring. <laughs> Um, another question? Hi, um, over here. Yeah. This is my first year working as a freelance costume designer, and I was just wondering, like, I can barely find time to take a shower, so I'm just wondering if you have any advice to manage your personal life and your career. Um, I'm sorry, you know, I didn't really hear you. Can you just... Uh, yeah, I can repeat me. everything. Yes, please. I was just saying that this is my first year working as a costume designer and I can barely find time to even take a shower. So I was just wondering if you guys could give me an advice to balance your personal okay, life. Okay, well, I'm, first of all, I'm very happy you're sitting in the back. <laughs> very far away from us if you don't have time to take a shower. So, um, so you're asking about time management and life and costume design. Yes. Well, um, before I let uh, my esteemed colleague answer you, I will say that um, our profession, which we know so well and so intimately, comes with a lot of sacrifice. Yes. There's a lot of sacrifice. We only have 24 hours in a day, and that means we have to choose how we spend our time. And Yvonne doesn't know and my colleagues who are working costume designers don't know what's going to be in their mailbox or in their inbox the next day. And that screenplay might, might be shot in Bucharest or in Prague or in Shreveport, Louisiana or here in New York and you live somewhere else and you have to make a lot of decisions about living in that motel room or in Almeria maybe. Uh, and you have to make a decision about, am I going to go away from my family for three months, four months, five months? So, um, yeah, what time management comes with a lot of difficult decisions as a costume designer because the work is 24 hours a day, seven days a week when we get started. So yes. how did you organize your life? Very badly. <laughs> I used to, I had a small child. I had nannies from hell. I remember when I was doing Superman, um, I had a nanny who I just didn't have time to fire her, and I sh she was so bad with my little boy who was a, a little angel, and, <laughs> and so I used to take him with me to the studio in the car every morning, yes. 
I had a, a playpen put for him in the wardrobe in the office that I had in, at Pinewood Studio, Shepparton Studio, I think, Shepparton Studio. Um, and I used to take him, and he, I put him in that office there, mm. and he would play in all the wardrobe people. Whenever they were coming in and out, they would go and ask him. They would go and play with him. I used to take him to the restaurant at lunchtime. Mm. It was not a happy situation at all. And then very often I had to leave him with somebody and because I had fittings. And I remember him saying, he's looking very upset and saying, go a Burmans. <laughs> oh, Mummy, go a Burmans. Oh. So it was, it's hard. It's very hard. Um, but uh, one does it. I mean, you just get around it. And I don't think he's suffered too badly. No. Um, he's now a cinematographer. And yeah. he's got his own children, and he's yeah. away from them, too. Yeah, but there's and another... There, there's there's another, nothing you can do about it. No, there, there, you know, the other choice is cats. <laughs> you know, they're very self-sufficient, so I would say cats, you know. Yeah, yeah I would say cats. I was Thank president you. of the union. I recommend cats. <laughs> okay. Uh, another um, last question, you think? Last question. It's uh, nearly 7.30. Yes. Hi, I actually am the East Coast version of Western costume for 35 okay. years. And I've noticed that um, movie budgets are smaller and smaller and smaller, and you have less and less lead time either to, to create, to hire the actors, to fit the actors. Usually they get cast maybe five days beforehand. How are you handling this now? Because obviously you had a huge budget in the earlier movies. Shrinking, shrinking time. Well... It's, it's true. The money is going to on the actors now, <laughs> yeah. rather than rather than on costumes or other things. Um, it's very difficult. There are there, the budgets are smaller. One has to fight for everything, and also, particularly in the United States, if you go one penny penny over cent over budget, you're on a blacklist. So yeah. it's very it's very difficult. Um, I refuse films if, if the budget is too small because I think that's, I can't do this. this. This one I can't do. If I can't do a film the way I want to do it, then it's better I don't do it. Let somebody else have a go. And that's really typical now. Um, among my colleagues who are um, major designers like Yvonne, uh, the, um, the, it seems that movies are more expensive or much less expensive. And it's quite rare to find a movie that is a moderate budget film. Costume designers are be, being paid less than they were paid 10 years ago. Absolutely. So not only ha have our salaries flattened, but they've been reduced along with the pre-production time. And so in a way, it's a bigger opportunity for younger and less experienced designers because as major designers, should refuse projects that um, have budgets that make them impossible to work on, really. Um, uh, it, there is an opportunity for young designers to step in and say, well, maybe I'll work for free just this once. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>